reading this morning is from the 21st chapter of Revelation, verses 1 through 6 and 22 through 25. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with people. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Rick. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jake, and I'm one of the pastors here, and it's so great uh, to be together. I just, I woke up this morning, and despite all the reasons why I shouldn't be excited with the ice and the weather, um, we had a whole bunch of things like shuffling around staff this morning just to make things happen. It feels like there was a lot of things like against Sunday happening, um, and my experience just says to lean into that and that God is really up uh, to something. So will you uh, pray with me on that um, here as we dive in? Holy Spirit, we thank you so much uh, for what you want to do in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives this morning. We thank you that you have already been at work. Jesus, we thank you that before the sun was even up, your spirit was here in this place, um, dwelling here, preparing it, that God, you woke with us to prepare our hearts for this day before you. So Jesus, may we open ourselves up to you here uh, this morning. May you open our hearts and our minds to what it is you want to say to us. God, may every word that comes out of my mouth here in our next moments together, may they be solely from you and not from my own. God, we just give you this space and time. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, So uh, last Sunday, um, I had a really uh, interesting conversation with my kids. They're five and seven. Um, And like I do most Sundays, I ask them um, in the afternoon, hey, what did you guys learn in your groups in TK that morning? What did you guys, what did you do? Um, And my daughter, who's a little bit of a ham, she said, Jesus is gourd. Key, key phrase, so a little too much veggie tales for her, I think. Um, and she sat there and chuckled to herself. Um, and my son, like, quickly was like, no, that's not what we talked about. Um, and so we talked about rules. And I was like, oh, right, you guys did the Ten Commandments. And so I said, guys, what are, what are some of the rules that you're supposed to, uh, to, supposed to follow? Um, and my son started talking about, well, you know, put God first, um, worship God only, um, and I was like, oh, cool, they, they actually downloaded these. So I said, well, what about, like, do not commit adultery? And they just both looked at me weirdly, and I was like, okay, great, TK edited that, good, good, <laughs> don't have to go there. And then my daughter says, well, listen to your parents. And I was like, yes, that one stuck, good. 
As I, so I said to my kids, like, that's a really, really good rule, guys. And because this is the way my brain worked, we had just read it, and I think it's part of the curse of being a pastor's kid. Um, I said to them, hey, guys, do you know that the Bible says if you don't listen to me and mom, we can take you to our friends and throw rocks at you? Okay, Deuteronomy, it's there. It's the word of God. Uh, my daughter, like in her five-year-old brain, just was like, that doesn't sound right. She was like, really? Does that, is that true? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> it technically is. And my son starts spinning with it. And he was like, well, that, that would hurt us. And I was like, yep. And he thinks about it a little bit more. And then he goes, well, you could do little rocks. <laughs> little rocks wouldn't hurt. Just don't throw them hard. And please be assured, I then said, we will never, ever throw rocks at you. But it does just bring up um, just fascinating questions of what do we do with some of these weird, obscure passages um, that the Bible is full of that we just kind of read. Um, and in my experience and in, in my education, what I have found is that when you get away sometimes from the literal and pull back with some really good questions, all of a sudden the scripture comes alive in a little bit of a different way. And so with this verse, what do we do with the idea? What does it say uh, that discipline should be a big part of parenting? This isn't just let your kids do whatever they want and then having to respond to that, but it's no discipline teaching them, coaching them how to live is a really, really big piece of this. And then what does it mean that even when you're disciplining your kids, when you're at your wit's end, the passage says to go to your community and specifically go to your elders. Get some support, get some help. Beyond that, um, it also specifically says that the parents are claiming that their child is a glutton and a drunkard. And I'm proud to say that does not describe my five and seven-year-old. Hopefully that's the case for you. Maybe gluttons, they, you know, they do like stuff, but definitely not the drunkard piece, right? So, so we're probably dealing with a teenager or a young adult here. So how does that inform our thinking? And then lastly, what do we do with the fact that the rabbis made it really, really hard for this law to ever actually be followed? And many early Jewish writers claimed that this law was never applied. And so is it more hyperbole and, a, and a, a teaching on parenting and the importance of teaching our children that it is about a literal law? And so just a couple of really good questions all of a sudden takes this really weird verse about throwing rocks at your children and all of a sudden gives us a really healthy, amazing conversation to think about as parents. And it's these kind of questions uh, that we're going to lean into this morning as we continue our series on the story of God and look at the book of Revelation, right? A life's easy, light topic, right? So I think, I think, I was thinking this week, Revelation, I feel like is like the shark of the Bible, all right? And here's what I mean by that. Sharks have this reputation that they're these like horrible beasts killing machines. Like how many of you, honestly, you go to the beach and you just, you scan, right? You look for that fin. If you're a parent, even more so, right? Before your kids get in the water, there's just that like looking around, right? We do that because it's kind of been taught to us. Um, and yet a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were watching a documentary, and more people die every year by falling coconuts. More people are injured and killed by vending machines than sharks, and so why is it that when we go to the beach, we're on high alert for a shark, and yet when have any of you panicked about going up to a vending machine? Hopefully none of you. And so I think that's a description and a helpful analogy to think about Revelation, that its, its reputation is far worse than it really is. And when we compare it to other books in the Bible, there are interesting questions, there are weird things that lead to good conversations, um, but we actually can get a lot of really helpful truth when we understand how to look at the book. So let's pause there for a second with the story of God. Let's look back to where we've come from. And then we're going to talk about how does the story end. And so four weeks ago, we started this series, and we started with creation. And the idea that God made everything very good. And that we, as the pinnacle of creation, bear God's image. 
And that God invites each and every one of us to be co-creators with God throughout creation. And yet, the story continues with the fall, that, that we traded God's definition of what was very good for our own. We walked away from bearing the image of God and said, I want to make a name for myself. And so when that happened, we invited chaos and destruction and sin and death into the world as we tried to do things our own way. And yet, God was not content to leave us there. And so we talked about the story of Israel that through this family, this man named Abraham, that God wanted to bring people back to that very good, to that original blessing, to that co-creator invitation that God gives us. And so we looked at the covenants and the promises that God made to this people over and over and over again that was filled with grace and mercy And last week, we talked about how that grace and mercy was magnified in the gift of Christ and his death and his resurrection. And specifically, we talked about Jesus' claim that we, his followers, will do even greater things than what Jesus did. And so what does that look like now to live in that power and in that strength? And so today, we turn to Revelation and how the story ends Now, my first exposure to the book of Revelation was through uh, these books called the Left Behind series. Has anybody read them? Anybody? Okay, a number of you. So I was in high school. I decided to do a media fast for one month. So no movies, no TV, no newspapers, magazines. It was Bible and Christian stuff. And so I found the Left Behind series, and that filled up my month pretty quickly. Uh, My personality needs to finish whatever I start. So I went through all of the books and was waiting and bated breath for books 10 and 11 and 12 to come out um, later on. And so it's this entertaining narrative about uh, these two guys' interpretation of what's going to happen um, at the end times and how Revelation is specifically going to play out. And so that book led me to start actually read the book of Revelation itself. Um, And obviously going into education as a pastor and biblical studies, I started to learn all sorts of stuff about the book. Uh, And one of the interesting things of Revelation, so there are actually three different literary styles that make up Revelation. So you have apocalyptic literature, uh, that's a Jewish form of literature that's filled with a lot of symbols. And so you have to interpret those symbols and figure out what they mean and, and balance them with the present and the past and looking ahead at the future all at the same time. But then there's also a prophetic literary style within the book. And so the prophetic dynamic of looking at the present time and using that to look forward to the future And it's also a letter. So the the letter of Revelation was written by an author to a group of people at a specific time and place to encourage them. So it's also this very personal writing. And so this is where understanding what happens gets a little confusing because which literary, literary style are you in at this point and which one is this and which is that? And so you end up bouncing back and forth. And so it leads to a lot of debates. And so I remember in in Bible school, um, sitting up late at night, because these are the fun conversations that people studying the Bible have, and it would be like, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? When's the millennial coming? Who's the Antichrist? Which I have to admit, at that point in life, the Antichrist seemed to be easily defined by whichever presidential candidate you didn't like. At least that was my experience growing up, right? And so we would have all of these debates. Now, If you're in this room and you just are thinking like pre-trib, mid-trib, like what is he talking about? I have good news because what I finally landed on is that all of those specifics are not really what's most important. And so we're not going to be going through this is what revelation really means this morning in part because I don't know the answer to that question ultimately. There's actually four different biblical scholar views on Revelation itself when you dig even deeper. So you have preterists. Preterists believe that everything in Revelation happened in the first century. Past, done, it was about Jerusalem, it was about the early church, and over. Then you have historists. Historists believe that Revelation starts in the first century, but then goes all the way to the end of time in a future tense. Then you have futurists, Futurists read Revelation and everything is distant. And this is really where the Left Behind series um, falls in here. 
Everything is this seven year or a little bit more distant future, time of war and famine and tribulation and God really waking up his creation before the world is brought to an end. And then, of course, you have the idealists who think that it's all just symbols and pictures. But I love what one commentary said. The fundamental truths of Revelation do not depend on adopting a particular point of view. And I actually think Jesus would back this up. So Jesus in the book of Mark, um, he's talking about the end of the age and the things to come. And he says this, Concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, nor himself, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. And then he repeats this phrase, stay awake, stay awake. In other words, keep watch, pay attention. And so Jesus' own advice was not to worry about the specifics, the day or the hour, but instead it's like Jesus is saying to live in the present moment in full anticipation of what is going to come later. We don't need to know all the details now, but if we pull back, there are some really good truths that we can pay attention to that help us to stay awake and to pay attention. So, how does the story of God end? Telling you right now, spoiler alert, we're not there in Revelation, but I'm going to put it on the screen. So if you want to leave now, now's the time. All things will be made new. That's the proclamation of God. Behold, I am making all things new. It's like God goes back to the book of Genesis and all of the work that God had started and put in place, and God is committed to finishing that work. Behold, I am making all things new. And the fact that we are co-creators with God in the midst of that work, God is committed to being alongside of us until that work has come to completion. Behold, I am making all things new. Now, this is really important to understand. We often have these pictures of we're going to die and we're going to go somewhere else. We're going to go to heaven and eternity is going to be spent in heaven. Yet, that's not the picture that Revelation uh, puts together here. And N.T. Wright um, says it's best. The closing scene in the Bible is not a vision of human beings going up to heaven, as in so much popular imagination, nor even of Jesus himself coming down to earth, but of a new Jerusalem itself coming down from heaven to earth. And so that's what we just read. Behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem came down. N.T. Wright calls this life after life after death. That we're not just going to be on clouds somewhere singing with the angels, playing harps the way that we might have imagined it, right? With this idea of eternity in heaven. But it's actually the culmination of everything being made new, being given new bodies, our souls continuing to live on on this new earth and continuing relationship and community and enjoying the work being completed. And so in Revelation, we get a glimpse of what this new earth is going to be like. And I want to look at four markers here. So the first thing that we read in in verse 1 is that the sea was no more. And that's kind of a puzzling line. And what do we do with that? And if you're anything like my wife, vacation must include beach and ocean, right? So that doesn't sound like eternal bliss, that like the sea is gone. You can't, there's no digging your feet in the sand and listening to the waves. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like paradise. But see, for, for the biblical authors and for Jewish people, the sea represented a dark force of chaos, which threatens God's plans and God's people. And so it harkens back, Genesis 1, verse 2, the story starts with the earth was without form and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep, and that word deep actually can mean sea as well, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So it was like the story of God, the creation story starts with God taking the chaos and bringing order and beauty to it and separating the dark force, the chaos, from everything else and creating order. 
And so in the new heaven and the new earth, this work is brought to completion, that the waters, the seas are completely gone. There is no more chaos. There is no more threat to the world, to God's plan, and God's people. Because of that, the second thing that we see is that the dwelling place of God is with people. And this is really important on a couple of, of levels. First off, you see without the, throughout the Gospels, it talks about that Christ will come again. And almost every reference talks about Christ coming on the clouds. And that cloud reference harkens back to Exodus, what we've just read recently, and the Shekinah glory, the cloud that appeared to the Israelite people and led and guide them, guide them. And so the idea that Jesus is coming back on the clouds is this representation of the glory of God, the presence of God in its fullness coming back with Christ. Now, the other thing that's interesting, dwelling here actually means tabernacle, And so again, right back to Exodus, this tent of meeting, this tabernacle that was set up that that Moses and Joshua and the the, the priests could go into to experience God's presence. And we know with the way the story progresses that the tabernacle turns into the temple, this beautiful permanent structure, or as permanent as you can make a building, as the place where God's presence dwells. And then at the crucifixion, we read in the Gospels that the curtain temple that separated the Holy of Holies, the place where God's spirit and his presence dwelt in its fullness, was torn in two, representing that that access was open, that the New Testament writers took that and said that our bodies, we are now the temple, that we carry God's spirit. And so here in Revelation, we just get the next iteration, the next step into that, that now the whole earth is a temple. And in verse 22, we read that, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And that the presence of God is just, it's bright, and it, call, it brings about this light that sun is not needed on the new earth because God's presence is so close and dwelling with it. Why? Because there's no more threat. There's nothing else keeping God back. God's presence is fully here with his people. Which leads us to the third point. We will be God's people. We will be God's people. In contrast to other writings similar to the style of Revelation, Jewish Apocrypha, um, it was all about Israel. And so Revelation does something really important that it takes Israel and it just opens the doors wide. And we read in verse 24, by Christ's light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Matthew 24, Jesus talks about this similar thing, that the end is not going to come until the whole world has heard the gospel. And that the gospel story of Jesus has gone to all nations. And so there is no more chaos, there's nothing threatening God's plan and God's presence so that it fully dwells with people and that we, people, in beautiful diversity, will be God's people. And so in this new earth, we're going to look around and there are going to be people of different, different colors and different cultures and different backgrounds, all together united under Christ. And despite our diversity, the last promise is that there will be no more fears, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, and no more pain. We will be fully restored. Relationships will be without conflict, and there will be no more suffering. Amen? Isn't that what we all long for in the the week that you may have come in here with, right? That's what we long for. You may not have thought about it before, but Revelation is actually a book of profound hope. And compared to other Jewish writings, other Apocrypha were hugely pessimistic. Everything was awful and they were waiting for something to happen. And the reason that Revelation is so full of hope is because the climactic event had already happened. The death and the resurrection of Jesus changed things that now we are living in the reality of that resurrection and participating in it until it fully comes. 
And so it's not just this wishful thinking of something to come later. It's something that we're living and progressing in and evolving in and experiencing now because Christ came to give us life and life to the fullest. That the broken areas of our lives and the death, the areas of our lives that are filled with death and sin would experience resurrection. And so Revelation has this insane amount of hope. And so it leads us to a question, and a question that I actually want to pause and take a moment to sit in. With these truths of Revelation, with this bird's eye view of what's happening within this book, and what God is promising and saying is going to come to be, what will your relationships look like on the new earth? What will your work look like? What does justice look like? What does art look like? What does entertainment, economy, health, politics? What do all of those things, without the tension, without the threat, with God's presence fully with us, with all things being made new, what do the things in your life look like in the new earth? And I want to take a moment and and I'd invite you to just Open yourselves up to the Holy Spirit and bring that to God right now. Maybe it's the exact thing that you prayed about two weeks ago of that in-between thing that you're wrestling with. Maybe it's, it's something that happened this week that was, was a pure sign of, of brokenness and disconnect and pain. And I just, I want us to all come before the Spirit and just ask humbly for a vision and a picture of what will all things of our lives be, look like when they are made new. And so Jesus, we just invite you into this moment right now. Holy Spirit, guide us and lead us. May we bring our lives, our thoughts, our experiences, our pain and our joy all before you. And God, may you just give us by your spirit a full picture right now of what it is that those things will look like when all are made new. And may we just sit and hear your words and these pictures of our lives made new here in this place. I hope that that God just gave you such a beautiful picture of of your family, your work, your life. And again, I just want to go back to it's not just wishful thinking because we have a Savior, we have a God who lives with us now that invites us into that hope. Again, spoiler alert, all things will be made new. 
How would your life be different if you knew what your fourth quarter earnings were going to be like and that they were going to be very good and not just very good, but that the way that you were working and the way you were living now contributed to that? That's the promise that we have here and that's the hope that we have, that we can live with a fourth quarter mindset of knowing where we're going. It doesn't make life perfectly easy. It doesn't mean everything in in the physical will be fixed in the here and the now, but it means that we can latch on to that hope of what God wants to do within our lives. I love this quote from Craig Bartholomew, who agrees with with that perspective that that we're going to be in the new earth. And he says that this is the kingdom that Christ's followers have already begun to enjoy in foretaste. And so the vision that God just gave you, he wants you to begin to walk in the foretaste of that. And I'm not talking like a health and wealth. If you imagine it, it's going to happen. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that God wants to live in that hope of what is possible in the Spirit. And again, going back to Jesus and Matthew's gospel, as he's talking about the end of all things, he tells this story of a master who, who gives his servant certain instructions, but then leaves. And Jesus asks this question, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. This servant is not concerned about the specifics. He's not trying to figure out pre-trib, mid-trib, rapture, all of the specifics. He is latching on to this is what the master has told me to do now. This is the way the master wants me to live and the tasks that he has given me and the co-creator opportunity I have in this household. And I'm going to do that so whenever the master comes back and however the master comes back, I am ready. And so the closing question for us, with the vision that God gave you, what does it look like to live into that today? What does that look like on the drive home tomorrow as you get up for school or work or wherever you're going? What does it look like to live in to the reality of of the new earth and all things being made new? And part of that is what the table is all about as we celebrate communion. There's this invitation that we come together in the diversity that we represent. And I've said this before, but if you think about those 12 disciples coming around this simple table, I mean, there were tax collectors and then there was a zealot and they wanted to kill each other. There were people who had different opinions and different backgrounds, and yet Christ called them together and centered them around this meal that was based in sacrifice and relationship and giving to one another and the promise of what Christ would do in his death. 